Welcome. Good to see you again, Dr. Osmanov. Thank you, Sean. Thank you for your invitation. It was a great pleasure to be here. It's been a while since I saw you last in Kiel, right? Yeah. How do you like Seoul? Great. Um, I read about Seoul a lot, and so you call it the country of the morning, spring or fresh. And I feel really fresh here, and I found so much kind people around, and such a warm treatment at, as at home. Thank you very much. You picked the right, right month to visit here, because it's a May, and it's not that hot, not that cold at all. And the weather is usually pretty sunny, so quite different from Kiel, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> it is a very nice cit city in the Baltic Sea, but uh, normally a lot of raining days in the year. But it has its own pretty. Your country is different and, of course, attract me with the history and uh, tradition of hospitality of the Asian country. So, could you please introduce yourself briefly? Yeah, my name is Daniel Rasmanov. I'm a professor of urology. <laughs> What's your area of expertise among the urology? So I'm responsible for robotic program in our hospital and consul surgeon and a proctor for robotics. I also responsible for conventional laparoscopy, 3D laparoscopy, and I'm a head of andrology units um, taking care of penile reconstructive surgery, in particular uh, implantation of penile prosthesis, mm -hmm. artificial sphincters, and take care of the educational part of the university activity. So I'm teaching students. So where were you born? I was born in Kyrgyzstan, in the mountain region of Central Asia. It was a former Soviet Republic, but since 1991, it's independent country. The history is many thousand years of this small uh, folk group of Central Asia. They have unique culture. They have own language. Why did you choose uh, medicine as your uh, university education? That's an interesting question. I thought about it because my son asked me the same question. So my mother, she was internal medicine. She was a oh. gastroenterologist. Interesting was, and I didn't know, she was the first female specialist. Uh, she was trained in Moscow and oh she was boy. the first one who did gastroscopy in my country <laughs> back to the 60s. Wow. And I was so fascinated because she wrote a few papers and uh, fascinated on pictures mm. of human body from inside. Oh. And uh, I was more or less infected mm. Mm. by the idea mm. of doing the same. Mm. So, and I <clears throat> decided it was at two years before graduating the school uh, to study medicine at the Kyrgyz State Medical Academy. Why urology? This is an interesting story behind because we studied this small surgical disciplines such as urology, gynecology, or uh, throat surgery, mm. or um, ophthalmology um, at the last semester mm. during the study. Mm. And my mentor mm. was urologist and he was a different one. Oh. And instead of giving us lecture, mm. boring lecture for younger guys or students. He always brought us to the theater, to the operation theater, and he did a lot of surgeries. Mm -hmm. And I was observing how he do the surgery, his hand work, mm -hmm. and I was falling in love mm -hmm. with urology. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is one of the main factors. So you wanted to be a surgeon, not an internal medicine guy? I wanted to be cardiologist or oh. a nephrologist, actually. Wow. Because my mother was very fascinated with internal medicine, and I learned a lot from her mm. at home. Mm. And I thought immediate result of the treatment. So uh, if you have a stone and take out the stone, so probably you, you can cure the patient. Sure. In case of high blood pressure, you cannot actually cure the patient. You can somehow... Um, make this situation, his situation better. And so that was maybe one of the reasons uh, to choose surgery. So you got your board certification in Kirkiston? Yeah, I, mm. I get uh, my urology certificate mm -hmm. 
as a healthcare professional mm. urologist. And then I um, decided to continue my career in Germany. Why? All of a sudden? It was not planned. So um, I had a good mentor in the hospital and I helped him get in touch with American urologists and surgeons and I was um, pretty good in writing applications and uh, a few of my applications uh, were successful for them and I, I didn't want actually to go abroad to study mm -hmm. medicine or urology but uh, this guy whom I helped asked me whether I have interest to visit Germany because he had a connections to Germany. I said, okay, I will try, and I wrote an application, and I was invited by the German uh, academic mm. uh, exchange office, and uh, so I, I won the stipend. So you went to Germany all by yourself? So I, yeah, it was uh, in, in the 3rd June 2000. I was 25 years old, and I had 80 German mark in the pocket. I had no suitcase. I had just a plastic pocket with a jeans and a t-shirt. <laughs> the interesting thing, Je Sean, that I have still these jeans and this t-shirt. Oh boy. But you had no relatives, friends, nothing. No, no. Where did you stay? I couldn't even uh, speak German. I could only <laughs> speak English. English? No German. So you went there with no one you know of, no money in your pocket, but just as you, well, expecting the stipend. How were you able to stay? Hey, it was a nice story. I was flying uh, through Istanbul, Turkey, mm -hmm. to reach Germany. I, w I landed in Frankfurt. And I sat in the airplane with a young lady. Mm. Unfortunately, this lady forgot her money. I didn't have the money no. to buy uh, a lunch. Oh. And I said, 70 mark, and <laughs> I have a cash maybe uh, in my pocket, uh, 10 mark. And I bought lunch for her. Oh. But I didn't buy it for me because it was too expensive. Oh. And I said, I, I don't want to eat, please. I was in the airport, but the, the Frankfurt is one of the biggest in Europe. Oh, yeah. I was lost. Mm. I've never been in, in different mm. country, mm. everything in, in German or mm. in English. Mm. And I had only uh, the paper with the address of mm. the school, mm. but I didn't know how to get there. Mm. And fortunately, this young lady, mm. she was going to marry the German guy. And suddenly she met me, hmm. and this German guy helped me to get to this place. Wow. So it was good invested money <laughs> <laughs> for the lunch. <laughs> and I spent the weekend mm -hmm. in this hotel because the school already rented a hotel for oh. me. And uh, from Monday I started to, to learn German mm. in a school. In a school. So you started learning the language first? Yes. Mm. Four months. Four months. Uh, th three months. Three yes, months. Three months. So after the language school, what, what did you do? So and then I was in Marburg. Marburg is one of the oldest university cities in Germany. Well, and then I moved to Mannheim. Mannheim is a university hospital which is a branch or related to the Heidelberg University. This is the one of the oldest and known university in the world. Then started on the next day practice in urology mm. was my fellowship. So salary is better in Germany? From that time point, um, I haven't got any money from, from the academic exchange. Why? You had a stipend. What yeah, I, I had a stipend, but I couldn't get it because of any reasons. I don't know why, but... Then how did you manage your, your daily hold? Yeah, it was difficult, so I couldn't pay for my um, uh, room. Yeah. And I, paid for the first two months. It was really difficult and I couldn't ask for help because I was just newcomer, nobody knows me. Sure. And um, I didn't have any money to eat. And sometimes I was able to come to the hospital in Mannheim to do some research. And fortunately it was a small room where I could sleep, but I, I did it in the night time because uh, otherwise you can get in sure. and just stay and if somebody asked me, I just told them, I want to study a little bit, I'm sorry. So I could survive four months in this room. And then um, I applied for several stipends. And because of my origin, I'm Kyrgyz, and Kyrgyz are Turkish-speaking ethical group. Mm -hmm. So the Turkish people that live in Germany, they have a community 
which helps students from Turkish-speaking countries to get a stipend. Fortunately, they immediately contact me and I explained the situation and they gave me the stipend. So I could survive only because of Turkish-speaking people, just normal workers. So for four months, you were homeless people. Yeah. Got nowhere to go. No. And you kind of sneaked into the uh, lab or study room to sleep. Yeah. But I, I mean, <laughs> I, was, I was young. And I, I need only just the small things to eat because fortunately we have crackers, or snacks um, in the hospital in oh. the daytime and I could eat, so. You know, I have been interviewing prosthetic urologists yeah. all around the world, which I think they are successful. Good portion of them are diasporics, like yourself. Every single one of them has a fascinating story of their past. How they become a urologist in a different country. Many of us know, you know, being a doctor in some country is a privileged job. At the same time, urologists are even more. So it's a highly competitive area. Diasporics, as a foreign people, they went into the system, did the comp competition all at the same time, and they survived, and they become a successful urologist. In my eyes, it's like a, like a, like a huge drama. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know that you had, you know, uh, that kind of rather reckless <laughs> <laughs> arrival to the Germany. But anyway, yeah. wow, good and job. So I told about crackers. Mm. They were very, very tasty. <laughs> and sometimes I was hunting for them mm -hmm. in the night because uh, daily time uh. was difficult and. Uh, Besides, the students always hungry. It was nothing for me. And in the night, there is a duty nurses there. Mm -hmm. And one nurse was curious about me. Yeah, because I always come in the night and want to have crackers. Ah. That was Elena. My <laughs> <laughs> she, so we got married. <laughs> <laughs> she was asking, oh, why are you eating crackers? I like them. <laughs> Oh boy, you and couldn't then, tell her the truth though. And then uh, <laughs> she was a student in the nurse school mm -hmm. and they have to do final exam on some disease or operation. So, and she asked me to help her uh -huh. to learn radical prostatectomy, oh. my favorite one. Oh. I showed her, mm -hmm. so since that we, we got married. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so she was a student when you met yeah. her. Yeah, so those crackers helped me. <laughs> <laughs> now, for me, Daniel, when I went to the U.S. Yeah. to get trained, even though I was a board-certified board urologist in here, I uh, worked as a private practitioner for two and a half years. I had savings, but it was not enough to support me in the U.S. for more than six months. Yeah. I had to travel, you know, at lodgings and buying the equipments. It drained me out. My wife and I always went to the McDonald's to have yeah. bre breakfast almost every single day. Yeah. And when I came back to Korea, <laughs> for the next good, good five years, I didn't eat McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> I got so sick of it. So, do you still like crackers or not? Not actually. No. <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> but I have them as a, as a memory. No, no. <laughs> you had it enough. Yeah.